stay standing. Stay standing. Uh, it's, it's my great privilege today to introduce our guest speaker. You know, P Pastor teaches us everything is prophetic and God's timing is always perfect. And, you know, we didn't anticipate that Pastor was going to need to have a, a time of a respite. But I had received um, a text message from one of my dear friends from Texas. We got Texas in the house today. <laughs> Saying, hey, I'm gonna be in. I'm gonna be in Columbus. I'm gonna be in town dealing with some business. Would love to come and and hang out with y'all at the Harv on Sunday morning. I'm not preaching anywhere, so I'd love to come hang out. And then uh, little did he know that he wouldn't just be hanging out, but he would be standing behind this sacred desk preaching a great word to you today. His name is Matt Austin. And I'll let him give you all the details about where he's from and his church and, and all of that. All you need to know is he's full of God and he's got a word for you today. So can you welcome my friend, our friend, Matt Austin. Hey, let's give Jesus a hand clap of praise this morning. Come on. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? tell you what I am from Texas and I don't know nothing about this cold weather y'all I've had blizzards and all kind of stuff just but it's an honor to be here and to say in my eyes your pastor is one of the greatest men of God that's ever walked the face of this earth and I stand here today so honored and words would not do it justice what I'm feeling right now. But I am so honored to stand here. And I say that because I grew up in a pastor's home. And one thing you know about growing up in a pastor's home is that it's easy to see a platform and not see the pain that helped build it. Uh, it's easy to see a stage and not see the sacrifices that laid the foundation for it. And so before we get going today, I want to honor your pastor, your pastor's family, the first family of this house, and say thank you for every sacrifice, all the tears we've seen, everything that we haven't seen. Come on, church, if you know you got the best pastors, such an honor. Thank you so much. Hey, you know, before you're seated, uh, I heard somewhere that one out of every three people is good looking. So just look to your left and right and say, it must be me. It must be no, I'm just kidding. Y'all look good. You may be seated. Man, feels good to be in the house. I am from Texas. I'm from the best part of Texas, Houston. Come on, H-Town, where you at? The land of James Harden. Don't get me started up in here. No, he doesn't travel every play. <laughs> every other. <laughs> Such an honor to be here with you. I do have a word from God, and I'm not going to be up here very long. Somebody said amen. Come on, somebody. Uh, if you'll give me 30 minutes, wave at me, wave at me. 30, 60, 90, 120, 150. All right, we'll be out of here in about three hours. Come on. If you got your Bible, go with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 27. I'm just kidding. Acts 27. Uh, I'm going to start at verse number 14. Just read a couple verses, and then we'll get right into the message. Acts 27, verse number 14. I'm reading from the NIV if you're following along, and it says this. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. And the ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. Matthew 14, if you got your Bible, go with me to the book of Matthew, chapter number 14. And we'll start reading at verse number 22. And it says this, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. We read one passage of scripture in the book of Acts where Paul is sailing to Rome and the Bible tells us that a storm picks up and they gave way to the storm. In other words, they let the wind drive the ship. The wind quite literally was at their back carrying them. 
We read another passage of scripture in the book of Matthew where Jesus sends the disciples across the lake and the Bible says a storm picks up and they headed, they could, they tried to head into the wind but could not. They were buffeted. So one passage of scripture, the wind is with them. Another passage of scripture, the wind is against them. And I want to preach to you this morning just for a few minutes from this thought, whichever way the wind blows. Look at your neighbor and say, we're going to talk about whichever way the wind blows this morning. Uh, it was hard to believe 2008 when a much younger, whole lot more foolish Pastor Matt Austin was convinced by a group of my extremely intelligent friends that the best way to celebrate my 18th birthday was to go to a magical enchanted place outside of Houston called Skydive Spaceland and jump out of a perfectly good airplane. How many of y'all know peer pressure will make you do some crazy stuff? <laughs> My mom, she's funny, and you probably heard this from your mama or your grandma. Mama. They say, hey, if your friends ask you to jump off a bridge, would you do it? Well, listen, they asked me to get up in a plane, and I did it. So I was crazy at 18. And what I remember about that process is when you first learn to skydive, you go through hours of prep courses. You watch like five hours of videos, and 10% of that time is spent learning how to skydive. The other 90% of that time is spent going over all the ways you can die by doing this. <laughs> Listen, I thought basically there was one way. You, you fall and you hit the ground. There's numerous ways, y'all. And I was well educated. And after those courses were over, I'm more scared than I've ever been in my life. And it's time that they bring you that waiver. Come on, you know the waiver. The one that says, if we do kill you today, your family can't sue us. <laughs> And I said, well, that sounds like a good deal. And I signed my life away and off we went. And you know, you know you're in trouble when you get on an airplane. And my life experience with airplanes is you get on the plane, it's comfortable. Stewardess comes by, flight attendant, bring you some peanuts, come on, a ginger ale. They shut the cabin door and then you take off. This plane didn't have doors. No flight attendants, no stewardess, no peanuts. I needed a ginger ale in a bad way. None to be seen. <laughs> and so we take off this doorless plane and we go 10,000 feet up in the air. And it's the most scary thing I've ever seen in my life. Because when you're 10,000 feet up, nothing looks the same. Everything that we love about life, like that just gives us joy, like trees. Listen, you will appreciate a tree, but it looks terrifying when you're up that high. And, and I had the <laughs> distinct privilege of going last which means I got to watch each and every one of my friends jump, and I don't know if they lived. I don't know if they died. I, it was like the rapture. All I know is they were there one second, and the next they were gone, and here I am. Where'd they go? But I'm next. And the first time you jump, you, you have to go with an instructor. And it was funny because I was fighting that man. He was strapped to my back. And I was fighting him every step of the way. It's like some of our walk with God. You know, we just, the Lord's like, come on. And you're like, no. I was like, Paul, none of these things are going to move me off of this plane in the name of Jesus. But he moved me and we got to the edge. And, and I think he realized somewhere along the way, this kid ain't going to jump. I'm going to have to do this for him. And so we get to the edge of the plane. He jumps, and the first thing I did was holler. And if I had remembered from the training videos, I, I promise I don't remember this, them saying, don't open your mouth when you jump out of an airplane at 10,000 feet, I would not have opened my mouth. But because I didn't remember that, I hollered, and now once I got my mouth open, I couldn't get it closed. The force of the wind was so strong. So I'm falling at 10,000 feet like this <laughs> for what felt like an eternity, but in actuality was probably only just a few seconds. But luckily I got my mouth closed and I learned a valuable lesson that day, that day, just how powerful the wind can be when it's blowing against you. Nowadays, they have those indoor places. And if I'd have known about those places or, you know, if I'd had had one close, I would have done that first uh, because the difference is, as you know, number one, you ain't falling out of an airplane. Come on, somebody. 
But the difference is when you jump out of a plane, you are falling, which causes the wind to blow against you. But in these wind tunnels, they will quite literally produce a wind that will lift you up. So in one case, you're falling and the wind is against you. And in another case, the wind is carrying you up. There are two different predominant seasons that we'll go through in life when it seems like the wind is against us. And other times when it seems like things are going our way. There's going to be times in your life when you go through storms. And there's going to be other times when it just seems like you can't do anything wrong. And so how do we navigate those various seasons of life? And you know those kind of seasons. Sometimes everything's going your way. The Buckeyes are undefeated. Come on, somebody. You get in that relationship, and they're an angel. She's an angel. He's Prince Charming. It's one of those seasons. But it's amazing to me just how fast things change. <laughs> and the Buckeyes were cruising till they met Purdue. Come on. Oh, no. He didn't. One of those seasons. The wind changes direction. Man, she was an angel for about three months. Then you found out she was Satan's mistress all along. She done slashed your tires. Come on, I felt, I felt a witness. She done cut your clothes up, then put all your business on Facebook because that's how they do you in 2019. Woo, my God. I got some help from the brothers. Ladies, he was Prince Charming, but the prince don't got a job. Come on. The prince don't go to church. Plays Madden all day. <laughs> those, are fun, those are funny examples. And yet, well, some of y'all identified way too closely with. <laughs> but I think we all understand that there are going to be times in life when it seems like everything's against us. And other times when it seems like everything's working for us. And so the question that I've come this morning to ask you is how do we respond to the winds of life? Whichever way they're blowing. Because in a room like this, there are people of all different types of ages and backgrounds and circumstances. Many people in here are in the best season of your life. Many people are in here are in the worst season of your life. And you're sitting here this morning in a storm that you believe is going to take you out. How do we respond? More importantly, as believers, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, what is our response to the winds of life. Yesterday, I had some free time as I was preparing to preach, and I went to Hobby Lobby, which is God's store, and, and I, I picked up a wind chime. And, you know, because it's from Hobby Lobby, it's a saved wind chime. For real, don't step to this wind chime because it has every Planet Shakers album. Come on, it went to Dominion Camp Meeting this past, come on somebody. This, this wind chime will cast a devil out of you because it's from Hobby Lobby and they love Jesus. And so I picked up this saved wind chime and I did a little bit of research on wind chime. I found out that in about 1100 BC, it was the Chinese that were among the first to appreciate the sound and the song that a wind chime makes. And they began to craft by hand these beautiful wind chimes that would produce amazing melodies whenever the wind began to blow. Uh, you know what I love about this wind chime? I was thinking about this, man. It just fired me up. Uh, it doesn't matter to this wind chime which way the wind is blowing. The wind can blow from the north, and this wind chime is going to sing. The wind can blow from the south, and this wind chime is going to sing. Whichever way the wind is blowing, this wind chime was made. It was constructed. It was created to produce a sound. In Psalm 148 and verse number 5 says, Let all things praise the name of the Lord because they were created at His command. And God sent me here this morning to find somebody that's been rocked by the winds and waves of life. And the enemy's been trying to steal your sound. But God sent me here to find somebody that'll stand up with me this morning and declare to your storm, whichever way the wind blows, I'm going to sing. Whichever way the wind blows, I'm going to worship. Whichever way the wind blows my storm will not cause me to go silent but whichever way the wind blows 
I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Come on, wind chime, take 30 seconds and give God a shout of praise. Hey! You know what I love about that wind chime? Wind chime can't tell the wind no. Some Christians, my God, things get a little bumpy, a little rocky. They go silent. Stop giving. Stop serving. Tithe drops off. They go silent when the wind picks up. The wind chime doesn't go silent when the wind picks up. When the wind blows harder, the wind chime just gets louder. God's looking for a praiser like a wind chime. Even though the devil's throwing everything he's got at you, you better respond with a loud shout. Just get louder. Come on. Just get more faithful. Just get more committed. I'm looking for a wind chime, Christian. Doesn't matter what's going on in your world, you got a reason to give God praise in your storm. I'm going to give you one right here. We, we could get on a plane this morning, and we could go to Sri Lanka, and I could take you to Candy, Sri Lanka. Somebody said, my God. And, and I could take you to the Temple of the Tooth, where there you can see the relic tooth of Buddha. They got it there because when Buddha died, he stayed that way. We could get in that same plane, and I could take you to Saudi Arabia, and I could take you to the Green Dome where the remains of the so-called prophet Muhammad lay buried because when Muhammad died, he stayed that way. But if we got in that same plane and we went to Israel, I could take you to the tomb where the Romans put Jesus, but you wouldn't see nobody because Jesus may have died, but he didn't stay that way. You got a reason to shout. Because he's not one of many. He's the one and only. He's not a king among kings. He's the king of kings. And he's not a distant God. He's an ever-present help in times of trouble. He said, where two or three come together in my name, there I am in the midst. You ought to sing like the wind chime this morning because Jesus is in this house. Come on, sing for the king real quick. Give him a shout of praise. Whichever way the wind is blowing. If you're in a good season, that's for you. If you're in the worst season, that's for you. you Got to praise him like Jesus is in the house. I thought about that, that woman the Bible said she came and anointed Jesus. Y'all remember that story? She brought that alabaster box, very expensive perfume. She brought it in there and the Bible said she busted that jar open. I, I like that she didn't open it. She broke it. In other words, she wasn't saving nothing back. I'm so sick and tired of going to church on Sunday morning and looking across the auditorium and there are Christians that are saving their shout, saving their leap, saving their dance, saving their clap. God's not looking for people that'll save stuff. You ought to come into this place, come into his presence with everything you got and break it before his feet. Come on, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Come on, break the jar. Give him your dance. Give him your clap. Give him your way. Don't save it. Break it. Because Jesus is in the house. She comes in there where Jesus is, and the Bible says the Pharisees start criticizing the way she's worshiping. That's too much. That's not necessary. That's costly criticizing her. But you know what I love about this woman? Is she refused to be distracted by the critics. She understood something. She wasn't there to see them anyway. Hey, you, you want to know what I have to say to somebody that's critical of the way we shout and critical of the way we dance and critical of Holy Ghost Church? Hey, baby, I didn't come to see you anyway. I came to Columbus to see Jesus. If you came to see Jesus, let out a roar in this. I came to see the king. Hey. Woo. Somebody's getting your roar back this morning. Because the storm tried to steal it, but you're getting it back this morning. You're finding your praise this morning. You're finding your shout. I love this. Oh, my God. I love this. Some of y'all that have been through it. 2018, I went through it. Come on, anybody else? Just one thing after the other. Boom, boom, boom. I was thinking about a sword. When a sword meets the grindstone, it's ugly. 
That grindstone, I don't know if you've ever seen one, it's rough, it's crude, it's nasty. And that sword meets it and that was me last year, just one thing after the other. Someone in here, you're just like that sword. The devil had you on the grindstone. But you know the thing about a sword is if you keep it on that grindstone long enough, eventually it's going to get its edge back. Oh, come on. Your praise may have went dull. Your worship may have went dull. Your faithfulness may have went dull. But the devil left you on the grindstone just a little bit too long. Somebody's getting their edge back. Somebody's getting their shout back. Somebody's getting your worship back. Come on, let them know you got your edge. Let them know you got your roar back. Give them a shout of praise. Yeah, I feel my edge coming back, Pastor. 2019, we're taking back everything the enemy stole from us. Don't get comfortable in your circumstance. Don't get comfortable in lack. Don't get comfortable in bondage. God's got something greater. God's got something bigger. God's working for you. I was preaching last week about Peter. Peter was in that cell in Acts 12. Guarded two guards, two chains, sentries. Guarded up, and he had got so comfortable, the Bible said he was taking a nap. Sleep. Peter's resting. Comfortable in that jail cell. Some of y'all are comfortable in bondage. The Bible said God sent an angel by. And I love what the, the scripture says. The scripture says the angel struck him. Didn't, you know, you know Peter, hey, wake up. Didn't tap him. It struck Peter. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for a God that when I get comfortable and complacent in my sin, when I get comfortable and complacent in lack, God will allow some things to come my way to smack me upside the head so that I can wake up from where I'm at and understand that this isn't all God has for me. But if I lay down some things for him, come on, if I'll consecrate myself to him, God's got something more. Don't get comfortable. And if you're not comfortable, it's time to start dressing different. Verse number 12. The Bible says, Acts 12, verse 12. The Bible says, the angel says, Peter, put your clothes on. In other words, take these prisoner clothes off. These rags. Get that off. You're looking like this circumstance. Get that off because you're not going to be in this circumstance forever. There's someone, if you're expecting a miracle, if you're expecting freedom, you ought to dress for the occasion. That angel said, that angel said, Peter, put your shoes on because it's a long way to Mary's house. Peter, put your robe on. We got to get it. Peter, you're dressed like you're going to be in this prison forever, but this is a jailbreak and you ought to dress for the occasion. Hey, I come to find somebody in this place and tell you that you're not going to stay in that bondage forever, but God is orchestrating a jailbreak and you ought to just dress for the occasion. Somebody came in this place so you can put on the garment of praise and throw away your depression, throw away your negativity, throw away your doubt because it's about to be a jailbreak into your destiny come on dress for the occasion give God a shout of praise uh -huh. if you're waiting on a miracle don't give up on God if you're waiting on a miracle don't you ever give up on Jesus because it's never too late for Jesus one of my favorite portions of scripture 1 Samuel chapter number 16 when the prophet Samuel goes to anoint the next king of Israel, he goes to Jesse's house and he understands that the king is here somewhere, but he doesn't know who the king is. And Samuel shows up and he goes one by one, Jesse's sons. And he says, Jesse, do you have any more sons? Because I know the king is here somewhere. I, I just, I can't see him. He's not, he's not right here. Do you have any more sons? And, and you know the story. The Bible said, Jesse looks at him. He says, well, well, there's one more, David. But, but you don't want David, you know. He's the runt. He's out there tending the sheep. There's one more, David. I want you to see what Samuel says, and I love this. He says, Jesse, send for him because we will not sit down until he comes. 
Samuel says, we're going to stand with a posture of expectation until the king comes. We don't see the king yet, but we're not going to sit down. We're, we're going to stand in expectation until the king comes. And I'm just here to tell someone in the storm, don't give up on God. Don't sit till the king comes because your miracle's getting closer. Your breakthrough's getting closer. Don't sit. Stand in expectation. Because you're closer than you think you are. You can see somebody that's expecting. They look different. They dress different. Those of you ladies that have children, when you were expecting, you look different. You walk different. You ate different. You acted different. I had somebody ask me one time, Pastor Matt, why do you get so loud? Why do you run around and hop like you do? I said, friend, it's easy. It's because I'm expecting. Hey, when you're expecting, you praise different. When you're expecting, you worship different. When you're expecting, you can't just sit in your seat on Sunday morning when you know God can do anything at any moment. It'll make you bust out a dance. It'll make you bust out a shout. It'll make somebody that's expecting, give them an expectant praise. Hey, praise them like it's closer than you think. I'm going to say this and then I'm done. My God. The Lord is in this place. I don't care how dark it is today. You could be one second from your miracle. One second to the next. Because that's the way God works. In the beginning, the Bible said it was dark, darkness. But one second to the next, God says, let there be light. And it wasn't a progressive. One second to the next. It went from as dark as it had ever been to brighter than it's ever been. And I want to tell someone sailing through a storm this morning, don't give up in your darkness because you could be one second away. You could be one moment away from your miracle. The darkest moment of my life was in the year 2007, darkest season. My oldest brother, Sean, passed away at the age of 27. My father had what I would describe as probably a nervous breakdown of some sorts. My brother Chase was home from Bible school and he was 22 years old. And, and he comes and my dad says, Chase, I, I need you to just encourage the people right now. And so Chase steps in at 22 and he's a young man trying to pastor an older congregation and the older folks hit the exits. They don't know what's going on with my dad, and I don't know that I blame them, but when the older folks hit the exits, the money hit the exit. And so we were in a new building, owed $4.3 million. Things got worse, worse, worse. Started missing payments. We lost, we had, I want to say 700, 800 people. We got down to a couple hundred on Sunday, could not pay the bills on the building. December 2011, we were all out of extensions with the bank. We'd done everything we could do, and we got a, a foreclosure notice. The bank says in 30 days, this is the beginning of December 2011, we're taking the building. 30 days, we're taking it. You're, you're shut down. We're trying to figure what's life going to look like after ministry. This is all I've ever known. Uh, what are we going to do? Am I going to get a job somewhere? I mean, I'm going to have to because it's over for all intents and purposes. It was as dark as it had ever been. December 30th, 2011, we get a call to the church from a man that had attended for some years but had no idea the amount of debt that we were in. And my dad had not disclosed the number, which was 4.3, because in his thinking, if you're on a sinking ship, the last thing you want to do is get up and say, hey, the ship's going under, you might as well find a ship next door. And so this man calls. He says, Pastor, I want to meet you at the church tomorrow. There's something I want to hand you. And so the next day, this man shows up to the church, and he brings a check with him. We were $4.3 million in debt. He says, Pastor, when I walked through these doors, he said, I had prepared to write you a check, a check for tax purposes and everything for $1.5 million. He said, I spoke with my attorney. I had everything filled out but the amount. He said, but when I got in here, something told me to just start writing fours. And on December, I got a picture if y'all can throw it up. If y'all, On December 31st, 2011, 4.3 million dollars in debt God sent an angel through our doors with a check for 4.444 444 I don't care how dark it is 
it's never too late for Jesus. Come on, if you need a miracle, give him a shout. If you need a miracle, sing like the wind chime. It's not over. My God. I'm here for the miracle people this morning. If you're in this place and your world is dark, I'm here for you. And God is searching for you. If you're desperate for a miracle, this is your moment. I want to pray for you. If you're in this place, step out of your seat and meet me down into this altar. Come on, from all over. Whatever's going on in your life, financial troubles, addictions, depression, whatever it is, bring it to this altar. Come on, from all over. We serve a God that can do the miraculous. We serve a God who's an ever-present help in times of trouble. He's in this place right now. There's someone you're closer than you think you are. Pack it in, guys. Pack it in. They're coming from all over. One second to the next. I'm standing here today because we serve a miracle working God. I can testify to you that it's not over in that situation. It's never too late for Jesus. Once you're in this altar, close your eyes, lift your hands up. And as the team begins to play and sing, Father, I thank you right now in this place. In the name of Jesus, for every need that's represented, Lord, I thank you that we make the decision today that whatever the storm is, God, we're going to sing through the storm. Whichever way the wind is blowing today, Father, we're not going to lose our faithfulness. We're not going to step back. We're going to step up and we're going to step into your purpose because, God, we know you're a miracle working God. The storm's not going to steal our song. The storm's not going to cause us to go silent. But Lord, we bring our needs to this altar. We bring our pain to this altar. We lay it before your feet. And Father, I thank you that you're the God of miracles. And this morning, you're releasing miracles in this house. Come on, if you believe it, sing it. Do you know he's faithful? going to fulfill it.
all these precious students that are in this place. I want to tell you right now, this world needs a fire yes. Yes. and boldness. Yes. Don't be ashamed of the Holy Ghost. Don't be ashamed of this gospel. And I want to pray for you in the name of Jesus that as God begins to send you out, you're going to shake this world yeah, for the yeah, God. Yeah. I believe the greatest sermons that will ever be preached are going to come out of your generation. I believe that the greatest revival we've ever seen has already started and it's coming out of your generation. So, Father, right now I pray for all of these young preachers, pastors, worship leaders, prophets, teachers, doctors, lawyers. Father, wherever they go to in life, I thank you, Lord, that they'll carry a fire with them, a boldness with them, that everywhere they go, the anointing of your spirit will go with them and the yoke of bondage will break. I thank you in the name of Jesus for the victory in this generation, and I declare it done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.